Thank you. Okay, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Pesmira Nushi today. Pesa is a researcher in the Adaptive Systems and Interaction Group at Microsoft Research. She is working at the intersection of human and machine intelligence to enable building machine learning systems that are reliable and can augment human productivity. Her research is currently focused on two main directions. The first is troubleshooting and failure analysis of machine learning systems for accelerating their software development lifecycle. And the second is human AI collaboration for enhancing human capabilities while solving complex tasks. Before joining MSR, Bessa received her PhD at ETH Zurich, where she worked on designing methods and algorithms for optimizing the cost and quality of data collection for training machine learning models. Thank you so much, Bessa, for joining us today. And the stage is yours. Thanks, Varan. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for introducing me. Um, yeah, so today I'll talk mostly about the first direction um, on troubleshooting and failure analysis for machine learning systems. Um, let's keep this interactive. I'm happy to take questions uh, anytime during the talk. It, it's better if we have a conversation rather than, you know, completing all 100% of the content. So, uh, so with that, uh, yeah, so I'll share some of the progress that we have done um, recently on uh, building these tools that can help machine learning engineers uh, to construct more reliable learning systems. And this is work done in collaboration, uh, not only with uh, Microsoft Research, but also with several product teams within Microsoft that built infrastructure for machine learning. And that would be uh, Azure Machine Learning and uh, Mixed Reality. Um, a lot of the machine learning, as, as you can imagine, in Vision in Microsoft is happening in Mixed Reality because they built HoloLens and, and all these complex systems. And, uh, and therefore, they have to build a lot of infrastructure as well. Uh, this is also work in collaboration with Ether, uh, which is a uh, sub-organization in Microsoft uh, dedicated to responsible AI. And of course, um, a lot of interns have uh, contributed to these directions over the years, uh, either with research ideas or also with uh, open sourcing some of the things that I'm going to talk about. Okay, so um, with that, um, Let's get started. Um, many of us are today excited about deploying machine learning in the real world. Uh, but many of us, when we look at these models and we understand uh, their performance, we notice that during the real world deployments, there may be critical failures that uh, do not correspond with uh, the evaluation that we might have done uh, ahead of time. So for example, this is the case of the Tesla autopilot that uh, mistakes the red letters in this flag. And uh, Baharan that has also lived in, uh, in Switzerland knows that this is a supermarket. Uh, but in this case, uh, the autopilot is uh, confusing them for uh, the red traffic lights because perhaps um, the system was never tested under these uh, conditions. Yet another example is this case that you might have seen from a few years ago, where uh, the image tagger in this case confused the human for a gorilla. So the bottom line for many of these examples, and I can give many, many more and, and have a whole talk about uh, all these cases, which is not what I'm gonna do today. But the bottom line is that there exists a discrepancy in uh, performance between the overall error rate that we observe during evaluation and for uh, sub pockets of the data that may have a higher error rate. Now, why should we care? Well, the thing is that the problem of inequality in the quality of service of several systems, not only in machine learning, is an open issue in many fields. It's a problem of coverage, meaning that discrepancy in quality will not allow us to provide um, top quality service to um, all customers. A problem of safety, meaning that uh, while our algorithms perform well on average, for usual input, um, significant drops for corner cases or pockets of data may even entail um, safety risk. And uh, this is just one of the studies, for example, in healthcare um, that is uh, pointing out that we need to be looking at uh, intersectional performance and also make sure 
that our algorithmic contributions do not contribute to increasing uh, inequality in the quality of service. However, now, if we take a step back into the engineering practices that we have today, we see that while we have gone a long way ahead in providing IDEs and tools for traditional software development, like for example, all the tools that you see here and more that you might be using in your own work as a student, as a researcher, um, you will notice that if you are a machine learning engineer, there is very little support when it comes to efficient troubleshooting and debugging and performance evaluation for machine learning. Um, in fact, in 2018, uh, we ran a survey study with more than 500 machine learning engineers internally at Microsoft in order to ask them about their main challenges and top issues that they have. And the main things that they raised were related to end-to-end -to -end, uh, tool fragmentation. So basically things are scattered, they're in silos and they are not integrated and the fact that there is a lack of tools and that debugging and, uh, and proper model evaluation and specification is difficult. So uh, while you might be a motivated and systematic engineer, the lack of tooling doesn't make your job necessarily easier. And oftentimes you have to build all this spaghetti of scripts that we all have written at some point in life uh, for visualization, visualizing and understanding um, what is really going on with the model or with the system. So the question is, how can we accelerate this process? Um, so to this end, I'm going to cover um, two topics that summarize our current efforts to address part of this problem. Um, of course, there's a lot more to do and, and I'm open to discussion um, even you know, during the presentation to see like, how can we improve these um, efforts. First, I'll talk about um, a tool set on doing error analysis for machine learning. Uh, this is a tool that we have had internally for almost two years and has had you know, internal usage from our engineers, but we are going to make available soon uh, in Azure Machine Learning as an open source offering. And this is gonna happen approximately in, in mid-February or so. And then I will touch upon um, another offering that is related to model versioning and model comparison with the purpose of being uh, backward compatible in uh, machine learning updates. And I will explain later on what, what the definition of this is and what it means to be backward compatible. Um, so let's start with um, error analysis. Um, so there has been a lot of discussion in the machine learning com uh, community uh, about um, where do biases come from, uh, where should we block them, what should we do about them, and even which part of the process to blame. Now, I, I want to make the claim here that while it is true that a lot of bias and uh, performance discrepancy issues in machine learning, they really start with the data, but finally they get baked into deployment uh, through poor performance reports. For example, how many times have you read articles in the media that claim things such as the model is 90% accurate on a particular task, or the model has reached human parity in, in a particular data set? And how many times have you thought, well, what does this really mean? And can we actually describe model performance by using a single number? Unfortunately, we continue to do this by using single aggregate numbers to describe model performance, even in you know, our papers or in uh, machine learning competitions like leaderboards, where uh, everything depends on that single score. And uh, not much effort is put into understanding where exactly the model fails. Or you know, when people ask you, what is the weakness of your model? Now, um, the problem here is that uh, these sub pockets of the data may exist, they may have a uh, lower performance. And in the real world, model performance can be wildly non-uniform. There are many studies that have shown this. One example is a gender shade study that showed that for the task of uh, gender detection, uh, these APIs coming from industry, including Microsoft, had a much higher error rate for women with a darker um, skin tone. And there are more and more examples like this. 
Now, again, I want to go back to the engineering uh, point of view. That is, how do I streamline this process of error identification? How can I make it easier for engineers? Because there are so many conditions of failure. And especially, you know, like in, um, in multidimensional data where these pockets can be anywhere, uh, how can I accelerate this development iteration by being able to identify errors faster systematically and in a more rigorous way? So um, to, to address these uh, problems, in uh, 2018, we came up with a methodology for error analysis uh, for machine learning. And back then, we called it uh, Pandora. And in Pandora, what we do is that we take the benchmark data, and we open up the box of system inputs, and we chop it into different semantic clusters. This was done back then for image captioning. Uh, but this, uh, and for each of these semantic clusters, we build um, interpretable models that can describe when and how the system fails. Now, based on these ideas, we then created this tool for error analysis. Uh, and, and the tool has the following workflow. The engineer comes in and inputs a benchmark. They run a machine learning model on it. And then they compute the error labels for each instance in the data set. Now, this means that you don't only store the overall, for example, log loss for, uh, for the data set, but you store the output of uh, the algorithm, you know, in, in inference time for each of the element of the instances in the data set. And again, you might like one may think that, you know, this is such an easy step, but it's like a big step forward for all the teams that work in deployment so that they do not only look at that one single number, but all these intermediate results are stored and are used in, um, in a useful way. Then we do some feature augmentation. I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, or uh, you might also introduce metadata or labels that have been collected to date together with the data set. And then we build interpretable error uh, uh, prediction and description models that uh, work at different levels of uh, granularity, either in the global level or just for particular clusters or for uh, individual instances. And more recently, uh, we have also integrated this effort with, um, with uh, model explainability techniques that come from uh, the Microsoft's Interpret ML repository, where for each of these clusters at different, you know, at different levels of granularity, you can also generate explanations about, you know, in what features is the model using in order to take a decision. So let me make this a little bit more uh, concrete and show you how we used um, the tool initially to understand the gender shades task. So again, uh, we use the same data set here. This is a data set of uh, candidates of parliaments around the world. And um, here, the, the authors of the paper, what they did is that they made sure that this data set was, um, was balanced with respect to gender and, uh, and race. So there is good representation there. And they found out this thing that, you know, for women uh, with a darker skin tone, the error rate is higher. What we did on top of this is that uh, we augmented the data with features that came from um, the Azure API, but you could imagine using other APIs as well. And this feature would talk to us about other attributes, face attributes, like for example, does the person have facial hair? Are they wearing glasses? Are they wearing makeup? And then we try to correlate all these features with um, the possibility, the, the probability of error. So um, this is just like uh, one screenshot from the tool. I saw one quick question. So for the last slide, so you said that this is a balanced data set, right? That they mm -hmm. try to collect. And even on that balanced data set, still the error is larger on some particular part of the data, right? Yeah. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah, okay. because, you know, like this is a benchmark data set that doesn't mean that the training data itself was balanced. Okay. On the model. Yeah. Um, so, um, so here is, you know, a screenshot, you're going to be able to see more of this, like when the tool is actually open source in, in mid February. Uh, but basically what we're showing here on the left hand side is uh, the set of features that we use to characterize failure and they are ordered by how much information gain does the feature bring into the probability of failure. 
So basically you can see here that gender is a good discriminative. And then there are other things like facial hair, which would, you could also think of as, um, you know, proxies to gender and to other, um, to, to other attributes. And, um, and then on uh, the right hand side, we see a decision tree. This is a very simple decision tree that is uh, trained not, not to you know, reproduce what the model does, but to describe um, errors and uh, successes. So basically it's trained on that error label and it's trying to best separate um, success cases from, uh, from error cases. And if we go top down, if we follow this critical path here, let's see what this says. Here we see that the overall error rate for this data set is 5.5%, okay? But then if we go a little bit further, we see that for women, um, the error rate is 11.5%. And then if these women are not wearing eye makeup, the error rate is 24%. And then it increases even more if these women have short hair. And even more if they are also not smiling in the photo. So, as you can see, and this becomes up to 35.7%. So it's like seven times more the error. So as you can see, the, this pocket of data where the error increases a lot, it's so complex that it is hard for the developer to think ahead of time that this error may exist. And that's why we hope that the usage of, the, of such tools may, uh, will accelerate the process. Now there are other functionalities that uh, that we have mapped to the tool as well. Like for example, something that developers really like is to actually be able to see the failure instances and the success um, instances side by side so that they can create further hypotheses about other features that might be useful in, um, in this process. Um, now, Again, uh, this, is, uh, this is sort of like looks more similar to the actual implementation that is going to be um, open source. Here I'm showing like just a case study on the classical UCI data set on income prediction. And for example, this is revealing a pocket of data with, uh, with more errors for, for example, for people who are married and who have a lot of capital gain and who have um, a higher number of education. And basically, if we look at, at this data uh, later on, um, what the model is doing here is that it is overestimating the amount of money that um, this category of people uh, might be uh, making just because it is you know, um, pivoting on very few um, instances. Um, so, um, we have seen this being uh, applied to several uh, real world applications. Most of these are internally at the moment, like for example, for things like eye tracking or uh, face recognition or for um, environment understanding. However, um, I also wanted to bring in the fact that, uh, you know, integrating these tools into the uh, normal tool chain is also challenging in that people today are actually working on five different tools. Like, you know, maybe they are using PyTorch for training and then another tool for visualization, like for example, Matplotlib, and they have built custom infrastructure for that. And uh, something that we are in the process of understanding now is how do we make this easy and how do we have a tighter integration story? Um, right, so, um, yet another question that comes up in practice is this thing about like, what features should I use, especially for vision data? What features should I use in order to do this um, correlation analysis? In that, you know, like um, the teams that are more mature, for example, internally, they have a lot of metadata and labels. Like they bring people in the lab, they, um, they know, you know, uh, how do they self-identify with respect to gender, they know age, they know other uh, properties. And they can actually, you know, just get this data into the tool and, and look at the analysis. But there are others who just have data, they just have images. And there, there are no attributes about this data other than the class label. So uh, often we get asked about like, how can we generate these features, you know, in a semi-automated fashion? And um, of course, you know, from a learning perspective, many of you uh, know that this is a super challenging problem. Uh, but here is 
our attempt to this. And this is work that is done in collaboration with uh, Sahil Singla. He has actually been leading um, the research project. And uh, what we did here is that uh, we used robust representations. So basically representations that are extracted from a robust machine learning model in order to um, extract these um, interpretable features. And there has been previous work done at um, uh, MIT from Spiras et al. that shows that um, these features that are extracted from uh, robust representations are actually more interpretable to the human eye uh, when it comes to you know, understanding where the model is focusing on. And we are using this layer as a descriptor or as a characterization for the content of the image. So let me explain you like what each of this really means. For each feature in, um, in the model, we show first in section A here, the top five images that have been most activated for that feature. And by looking at these top five images, the um, developer can you know, look at like what is in common between, between these images. Then we generate um, heat maps, CAM style heat maps, to show where the feature is exactly focusing on. So again, this is not the usual heat map that shows where the model is looking at to predict the class um, of the image, but just where the feature is focusing on. And the way how we do this is that we go back, like say I'm interested in this particular feature. I go back, I take, uh, I take the global average pooling uh, layer, and then I uh, get the feature map, and then I normalize it to zero, 01, and then we create the heat map for that. So typical camp style. And then the next uh, section is defining a uh, machine learning optimization problem whose goal is not to you know, solve a particular uh, classification problem, but to maximize the activation value for that particular feature. So basically it's looking around the input image and it's transforming it a little bit so that the value of the feature is being maximized. So if you think about it, like these images here, they do not exist in real life. These are just transformations of uh, the original image so that the feature is more accentuated. And now that, that you, know, you, you have an overview about what of this uh, really means, uh, then we can see what, what is the meaning of this feature. As you can see, this is um, including you know, more three layers into the, uh, into the image. It is imagining trees even where the trees do not exist. Like for example, here, there's our dogs and they are transformed into trees. And then you could think about this feature as something that describes pillar-like shapes, vertical, that, um, that look like trees. But why does this matter for error analysis? Well, this way, we um, try to debug like um, both a robust model and a standard model. And this is what it, this looks like. It's just one of the examples for a robust model. And there are more examples in the, um, in the archive version of the paper. And here we can see that for predicting the class of Potter's will, the base error rate is 66%, okay? So there's a lot of error already. But if this feature here is not activated, and at that point, this feature only has an ID, it doesn't have a name. If it is not activated, then the error rate increases to 85%. And then we go back and look at what this feature looks like. And this feature is looking at vases. It's not looking at the will itself, but it's looking at, um, at the vases. And similarly, you know, for a non-robust model, we see that for this particular class, which is a type of dog, the error rate increases uh, from 20 to 30% uh, when this uh, feature here does not exist. And the feature in this case is um, the color of the dog. And you could think about both of these examples as spurious correlations that may be present in the model and uh, that, that need to be addressed. Now, again, there are several things that one may think about extending in this uh, methodology. We have uh, had very good signal from developers um, saying that this is useful for characterizing the images, but they want more. They want, for example, a causal analysis about like, is this just a correlation, the fact that error is increasing here, or is this more causal? Like what would happen if I actually remove the color from this dog? Would it actually um, increase the failure rate or not? 
um, and they also want things like, for example, um, how can I actually fix the model after I have found uh, these particular mistakes? And these are all things that you know are, are great future directions and, and something that we'd really like to, to invest on. Um, so maybe you know maybe it's time to uh, to see whether there are any questions uh, so far before I move to the next topic. So I guess I have probably one question. So this is something that you mentioned, I guess, in the very last sentence. So I was wondering if this all these uh, in the first part of your talk, all these instances, failure instances that you find, and in the second part, all these features that you find that seems to be, I mean, wrong or by mistake or in the right way correlated mm -hmm. with the result. So do you also use these uh, observations to kind of fix the model or is that kind mm -hmm. of the plan probably you mentioned or have you already thought about this? Because it seems that it's a very good way if you know what are the failure instances? You try to incorporate them in the training data. You can somehow probably fix a little bit these mm -hmm. issues, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that is the point of integration that we want to, to make stronger, right? Because, so um, for example, for the gender shades uh, case, if, we, if you dig a little bit more into the data, you see, for instance, that for darker skinned women, there are very few instances of these women having long hair. So most of them have mm -hmm. short hair and uh, wearing makeup. So you see that in the data, if you go back to the data, there is very little representation in that. Mm -hmm. But in the training data, most of the women that have been in, in this training data, mostly because these are trained on you know, celebrity uh, data sets, they do have longer hair and they are all like you know, wearing makeup. Mm -hmm. Uh, so again, this brings up the fact that uh, of the you know representation in the training data itself. So this is the way how most of the teams have been using it so far, like finding instead of just saying collect more data mm -hmm. to target the data collection. Exactly. But there are cases when you also cannot collect more data. So these yes. are like all all the, the questions that we have. Like they just they just have no access to more data, for example, the teams. So does it help in those cases if you really do not have very small data sets to kind of prune those yeah. classes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But also to augment the data. Um, yeah. Like yeah. for example, Definitely. many teams do synthetics um, generation mm -hmm. and they use these holes to, for example, um, you know, to, to target the data generation because data generation is also expensive. It's mm -hmm. if it's done with high quality mm -hmm. computationally. Okay, so so and have you, I don't know, have you thought about kind of its relation or correlation of all these instances and failure instances with kind of the optimization that is happening in the background? Yeah. So there are, <laughs> yeah. So um, a lot of this comes because the optimization is done with only one thing in mind, and, and that yes. is log loss, mm -hmm. and and that is accuracy. Um, what is happening, for example, with uh, with the robust models is that the optimization is focusing so that this small, you know, perturbations around the image do not matter as much. Mm -hmm. I see. But that optimization comes at the cost of accuracy. Mm -hmm. It does increase interpretability, but it comes at the cost of accuracy. And, and then there is like a question of like, what is the golden trade-off where we don't have to, you know, um, sacrifice accuracy that much, but still can make use of, of these representations. Yeah, and all that philosophical issue with overfitting and so I guess <laughs> yeah. Yeah. as well. Okay, there is also a question in the chat. Let me ask mm -hmm. that one. And I guess there are more I want to ask you later. Yeah. So the question is, how does Pandora error analysis work for one non-image data, tabular mm -hmm. example, the tabular data? Will it make things as interpretable? This is, I guess, the first question or first part of the question. And second is that, does it work for online ML systems? Example for personalized ad recommendation system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
yeah so the so tabular data is fully supported even um in you know in the in the internal version of the tool but also in the one that is going to be open source um for these uh, tabular data we are directly using the features that the tabular data comes with and that makes the story simpler for, for us in that because you know these features are already extracted they are part of the data set and we can just reuse it as such um there are some other things that we are doing on top of it in order to do data comparison like for example one question that comes up is um, is there any distributional shift between the cases for which the model is wrong and for those that it's right? And so we're building some, you know, very basic, if you think about, you know, um, like statistical uh, visualization, very basic comparisons uh, between the data distributions that are uh, feature based. Um, on the online machine learning systems, there is one consideration that I want to talk uh, about in the backward compatibility part of the talk. Um, there are, at the moment, we do not have any specific considerations for, uh, for online uh, learning systems, but I think that the main um, step forward there is to include time in the analysis and make time as a you know, um, first class consideration in, in this analysis because you know like how, what happens sometimes these systems do not fail right away the on online recommenders but something happens in between and you need to monitor the system and find exactly the time where it failed and correlate it back with that point in time um, again we do not have any uh, specific functionality about this but it, it's definitely um, an avenue thanks Vesa. and if anybody wants to ask questions himself or herself just raise your hand and then you can ask yourself okay thanks awesome um so with that and i hope that um this is going to touch a little bit on the time dimension as well um so backward compatibility in machine learning is also this open source library that we have released but is based on previous research that we have done um in the topic now if you think about um you know, backward compatibility as a consideration in um, in software engineering. Um, here, um, we think about, you know, if you have two components, A and B, I update component A, and then ideally component B should just be working. But if a component B fails to work because of the update, then we say that the update is not backward compatible, okay? So stories is, um, is, is clean in software engineering. If we go uh, to the machine learning perspective, often we may see that component B may still work. The data exchange, the schema between the two components may remain the same. The software interface may remain the same, but because of the retraining, model A may be including new errors into the process that may make uh, model B fail, okay? Um, and, um, and in overall, you know, the accuracy rate may remain the same or even improve, but the new errors can be problematic if you think about uh, this model in the system's perspective. So let's see how we generate uh, performance reports today. Um, by the way, do you see this part of my screen here? Is it occluding anything? Uh, uh, the gray part? Yeah, I'll, I'll just took it away. No, there, no. there was like the zoom. Uh, no, no, we don't see. Okay, good. good. Um, so if you think back about like how we generate these performance reports during updates, what we do is that we have a baseline model. So the yellow model is the one that we have already deployed. And then we have a candidate model. And we look at the accuracy of both of this. And as long as the accuracy is higher, then we're like good to go. Let's deploy. But then if we look at uh, the errors from a different point of view, so say if we look at the errors in the form of a Venn diagram, and here we see you know, the baseline errors and the candidates the errors that are getting smaller because this is more accurate, then we see, like if you do this visualization for any update you do in machine learning, I, I, I can say with a lot of confidence that this red part here about new uh, errors and regress can be considerably high for any type of update uh, that you push. Now, ideally, you would want to 
deploy something like this, where um, all you know the errors are fully compatible. You are only fixing stuff and you are not breaking anything else. But things may may not wor work as well in practice. And the reason for that, you know, there are many uh, reasons. One of them, one of the main ones, is like optimization uh, stochasticity. Uh, there's a lot of random things that we do during um, during optimization. We can we randomize data augmentation. We do distributed training, model initialization, and the fact that you know uh, the batches in gradients and sand may also be uh, stochastic. But uh, say that we can uh, fix some of these things in uh, optimization stochasticity, and say you know we we know what the seed was and and so on and so forth. Then there exists the thing, the, the part of the data, you know, like you are um, you are updating the model for several reasons. It may be because you have more data and that data may come with label noise or it may come with distributional shifts. And because of noise or distributional shifts, uh, then you may not be able to maintain uh, backward compatibility. And then fundamentally, you may also change the model class. And if the model class changes, uh, then uh, these models may be good at, at different uh, aspects of the data. So again, this is putting the models into um, a systems perspective. You can think about this as uh, causing problems from a component, component, component collaboration perspective, like if another model is consuming your model, or if a human is consuming this model in order to take decisions. And um, we have looked at both these aspects together with Gagan and Mega, who have been, um, you know, interning with us. And also Mega was an AI uh, resident with us. And um, really the things that, that can break sometimes are uh, really surprising. Like, for example, what can happen in practice is that if you are an engineer, you're building this Model B, okay? You are already familiar with Model A. You know where it fails. And so you do something in that component beam uh, in order to suppress the failures of, uh, of model A. So think about it as like error handling. And then model A gets updated, it introduces new errors. And then the question is like, you don't have any error handling anymore in model B. Either you have to you know, uh, improve model B as well or retrain the, the whole system end to end. Um, from a human AI collaboration perspective, which is something that, uh, that we really work a lot in, in our group as well, is the fact that uh, when humans are, look, are, are using this model in order to take decisions, like for example, uh, a doctor using the model in order you know, to do a diagnosis or take a medical decision, they may create this mental model about how, the mo how it is working. Like for example, in this case, say you had a model that is 80% accurate, um, it's not like, you know, a lot of accuracy, but um, the human has learned that a model is trustable for elderly patients. Like it makes no mistakes for elderly patients. And then you update, this model is 90% accurate now, but it should not be trusted for elderly patients. And unless you take this into consideration during the optimization itself, for one, or you explain this difference to the human, then if the human is oblivious to what, what is happening, that they might be taking the wrong decisions because they have learned to trust the model now in the wrong places. Um, so basically what we're saying here is that you should be looking at, you know, during the updates, you should be looking not only at the accuracy numbers, but also at the compatibility numbers. Like for example, in this case, we're saying that the trust compatibility score is telling us like out of all the cases that were right for the first version of the model, how many of them remain correct. So basically how much trust is, um, is preserved. And then more from an error perspective, you could say, well, out of all the mistakes that I'm making in the new um, models, how many um, of them are actually known? So basically what, what portion of, uh, of the errors are, are not new? And um, like just another example here, say you had again this other model that was 80% accurate and now you may have two models to select from. Like model selection is, is huge in machine learning. Like, you know, uh, many of the things that we do are, are model selection. And we have, both of them have the same accuracy, 90%. 
But the second model is just trying to, you know, uh, find grave and carve out of the previous error region instead of uh, introducing new errors. And therefore it has um, higher compatibility scores. Um, again, as I said, this can happen in practice a lot. Um, these are just experiments that we have run on several decision-making tasks. And we can see that, for example, for this task, mortality prediction, uh, which you could think, you know, like it's, it's um, high stakes. Um, compatibility is uh, as low as 40% meaning that 60% of the cases that were right before are now uh, incorrect. Um, so what we did about this is that we reformulated um, the loss function during the update so that it takes into account, you know, the usual log loss, but also how much dissonance there is between the first version of the model and the second version of the model. Now we define dissonance in uh, various different ways. The one that has worked in practice uh, better for at least for the problems that we have considered so far is the new error dissonance. And basically what this is doing is that every time the first model was correct, we are adding an additional uh, loss. This is exactly the same, you know, log loss, but in, in this case between Y and V2. And this is happening selectively only for the cases when the model was, the first model was correct. Um, we think that strict imitation dissonance, which is very similar, you know, to the first one is also promising, but it depends on how well calibrated your first model is. Like if the first model is already like, you know, a good model has had a lot of data and can calibrate the probabilities, the SOCMAX scores uh, well, then uh, strict imitation dissonance can also be promising. So what we do with this uh, formulated loss function, um, here I'm showing some, uh, you know, um, uh, visualization uh, primitives in order to explore the frontier of the trade-off between compatibility and, um, and accuracy. For example, all these points here, they are different models that have been generated by using a different lambda C. And as you can see, if you do not account for this at all, like basically we are in the top uh, left part of the graph, you can have a high accuracy, but then compatibility can be really low. And then you, account, you start accounting for this, uh, you do not sacrifice much on uh, accuracy initially, but you can still improve compatibility. And then uh, you, you see that the frontier becomes a little bit um, you know, sharper towards this part. And then this then becomes a tool for developers for them to be able to do model selection uh, in a more informed way. So that you can actually say like, you know, as a deployment person, you know how much you can sacrifice in, in accuracy. Basically the discussion that we were having um, earlier. And then you can say, well, I want to be, for example, here in, um, in the curve. Um, so I see there is a question. So maybe like uh, before I move on to, uh, to the next slide that we can address that. Um, oh, do you I see, see the it. question? I do. <laughs> like maybe maybe okay. I'll, I'll take that uh, a little bit later um, okay. towards Great. the end. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we, we also think that this concept of backward compatibility can also be used in order to debug data. So imagine you have this use case where you have uh, updated your model with more data. But in this larger data, there is probably a lot of information, but there is maybe also a lot of noise or you know, distributional shifts. And um, here, for example, uh, this is just you know, the CIFAR 10 data set. We have uh, introduced noise to just between two classes, in this uh, case, car and truck. And then we are visualizing the distribution of um, incompatible points ac across the classes. And you can see, you know, the green part here is the case uh, with noise. And you can see that actually incompatibility does affect the classes that have more noise. So this could start as, you know, like it doesn't fix the process, but it, uh, it can be like as a starting point for looking at what data should you be excluding. Uh, from the new training data. Um, again, it would be great if that process happens end to end. So like ideally the dream here is for me to be able to just click here 
and then look at the data, see that there is noise and say, I do not want this data again in, um, in training. Um, now, based on these ideas, uh, we provided this library. The library has two parts. One of them is uh, the loss functions that I mentioned earlier, together with the metrics. Um, the loss functions are implemented in both PyTorch and uh, TensorFlow. And then there is the visualization tool here uh, that is implemented as a Jupyter uh, widget. Um, so I have a little video here that I hope is going to work. Um, so uh, do you see the um, animation so far? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay, so it's getting there. So basically I can select between training and testing data set. I can select the loss function. It's like, you know, a small Jupyter widget. I can look at the trade-off. Uh, as an engineer, I can select the model that I want to inspect. Um, I can look at the Venn diagram I can look at, you know, the data in the Venn diagram below, we can see like the full table. Um, and then I can also, um, you know, explore the incompatible points. In this case, all the incompatible points are in the uh, negative class. And, um, and after that, you know, I can go back and look at another model. Um, so, you know, um, all this is, if you can see like you you can do this end to end you can click into one part of the widget and look at the data what we cannot do at the moment is to say exactly the thing that i mentioned earlier exclude this data from training for another experimentation or just apply a simple data operation like a simple data cleaning operation um, you can customize the widget you can say okay i want to uh, have a different visualization like in the previous case, I was showing a tabular data set. This is an image data set, but I can customize it so it shows images or you know, um, images and metadata um, together. Um, so um, yeah, so this mm -hmm. is up on GitHub. Just feel free to file issues if you, if you happen um, to use it. Um, let's see. Yes, there's, there is one question related to this part, I guess. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'll just read out the question. Um, so for the compatibility score, if we are getting fewer and fewer error predictions, um, is it possible that we overfit to the uh, specific um, data set? Yes, I mean, that, that could uh, totally happen. This is why, you know, we need to be mindful about the, you know, the updating uh, process. So basically we need to look at the full frontier to both compatibility and accuracy and also be able to look at the data, you know, in, in a way where we see where exactly my model is, um, is regressing. Um, we have um, some more internal tooling that we are doing at the moment on more exact model comparison, things that can tell you that um, not only show you this Venn diagram that I showed earlier, like how much things are intersecting, but also explaining to you uh, what exactly this regress section means. Like, is it focused more on people that are, I don't know, uh, over 60 or that live in a particular geographical region, or is it focused on a different group? And I think there's a lot more we need to do about uh, doing more comprehensive uh, model comparison. Um, so, you know, like, I think this sort of sums up the, um, what I wanted to share with you. I also wanted to mention that except these two tools that I just uh, talked about, there is a whole other ecosystem that is focused more on interpretability, on fairness or on causality that are um, also part, you know, are also delivered by uh, Microsoft Research. Um, we are thinking um, deeply about how to integrate all this together into um, one tool chain and uh, we're excited about that. Uh, but I guess, you know, the bottom line here is that there exists a need for speed in um, the machine learning, you know, community, both in research and industry about how to do more responsible development. How can we really understand uh, and, and, um, and track when things go wrong? 
Uh, but in order to satisfy that need for speed, we need to have better acceleration tools uh, to support practitioners. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pasha. <laughs> That's very interesting. So I guess you have still one question, but if, if there is anybody else who has other questions, please feel free to ask. Let's see. So, um, so I'm I'm looking at, at the question. Um, so, did you mention how the features used for different levels of decision trees are determined? Do the users customize them? Is it possible that there exists uh, multiple ways of explanations? Um, yeah, so these features, um, as I said, sometimes they come with the data. If it is a tabular data set, they are part of the data. Sometimes they are metadata that the team has collected over time. And sometimes they are uh, these features that we extract in a semi-automated fashion by using um, robust representations where uh, we visualize the feature and then the developer has to, you know, um, understand what that feature means by using these uh, visualizations. So it is not a silver, silver bullet. It's like all these approaches together um, that, that can be customized in the tool. Are there any, are there uh, multiple ways of explanations? Yes, in the gender shades um, example that I showed, if I happen to deactivate the feature on gender, then um, I'll, um, I, I can predict with 100% confidence that facial hair is gonna come up. Like, uh, you know, because the, 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 the tool finds a way to find another proxy about explaining the same thing. Um, so there is value in sort of clustering these concepts together um, by using either, you know, human semantics or just like statistical correlation between the concepts. Great, so any other question? If not, I, I would ask you one final question. So do you think if there is any way that you can find these data points that for example, mm -hmm. doesn't allow the compatibility between these models that you are training or those failure instances, do you think there is any way to find these data points before you actually train on them? Yeah, it's, you know, but <laughs> yep, 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 yep. So we did, we we looked very deeply to uh, one of the papers that you, you guys wrote like a couple of years ago on mm -hmm. like the connection between um, example uh, forgetting mm -hmm. and uh, model distillation. So I, I think it is, the avenue is promising. So basically the experiment we did is uh, how is backward compatibility correlated with example uh, forget it, forgetting. There is, um, there is a high um, correlation. So you could possibly not do it without training at all. That would be a little bit difficult, but with just a little training. Okay, so yes. basically, yeah, just a few epochs to see, mm -hmm. you know, uh, whether there, there is high incompatibility. Yes. Um, yeah, so, so that is like in the KDD paper that we wrote, there are some experiments on that, but it, it, the correlation shows that that is promising. The other thing is, can I do that by using a distilled model? Mm -hmm. Like not training the full model, but just like a, a, yeah. a surrogate version of it. And uh, with that, we haven't done any experiments yet, but I, I, I think it's, yeah. It's so this is actually something I guess I'm thinking a lot about these days not mm -hmm. only in the case of failures, but what are the important data points? Yep. So I think we should talk about this. At some yeah, point. let's, um, <laughs> you know, yeah, let, let's, let's talk more deeply about this because yes. I'm, yep, there's a lot of, you know, things that developers come up with and say, oh, what mm -hmm. if I try this? And what if I try that? But then there's just too many things to try out. Yes, yes. Uh, so how can we kind of yeah. narrow it down for them? Yes, okay, that's something interesting to talk about. Okay, yeah. are there any other question? Otherwise, thank you so much, Bessa, for the very interesting talk. I enjoyed it a lot, and hopefully we will see you very soon again in this seminar. <laughs> thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, I really course. enjoyed it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.